Governor-elect King is expected to enter the building and make his way to the stage very soon. Last night he said that he felt like a kid the night before Christmas, but after tonight it will be all business for the new governor. There's a lot of work ahead of him. In the speech tonight, uh, he will be talking about some of the problems the state faces, how he's going to deal with a budget shortfall that measures uh, almost $400 million. He uh, is promising once again there will be no gimmicks, no delays, no new taxes. One of the things he's going to do is institute an immediate state hiring freeze. He's also talking about putting off what they call a pay payroll push, which is uh, putting off the last paycheck of this fiscal year for state workers into the next year. That's a way of saving money in this fiscal year. King says that's planned, but he's going to cancel that as a show of good faith about how he does not want to rely on gimmicks to solve the budget problem. In addition to a few specifics, I believe he's also going to try to set the tone for his administration in the next four years, a positive tone. That's right. New Senator Rob Caldwell is on the floor here at the Civic Center. Rob? Pat, I feel a little bit like a guy who's in a wedding party here, only I'm not really in the wedding party. I'm in the auditorium of the Augusta Civic Center, and the governor-elect Angus King is going to be coming right through here into the main auditorium in just a few minutes. They have changed the schedule just a little bit. The original plan was for him to come into the room about 7.15, 7.20. The plan now is to bring him in much earlier. He should be coming in in just, in just the next few minutes. His family is already in the main auditorium, his wife, his sons, his mother, who will be holding the Bible. And now I'm told that the governor-elect himself should be coming through. Here he comes, Angus King, who in a matter of minutes will be the next governor of Maine. Behind. And you'll walk in and step in. And as you can see, the... Uh about 6,000 people waiting there when the governor-elect goes into the main part of the Augusta Civic Center Auditorium. What we have going on here is actually a joint session of the Maine legislature. That's uh, part of the formality of swearing in any governor. And the announcement is being made right now that the governor-elect is ready to be brought in to this joint session before all the members of the Maine House and Senate. Much of this... Uh, may seem a little arcane. It's uh, an old-fashioned ceremony, obviously, and what they do is appoint committees that go out and welcome the governor-elect, and it's a chance for members of the legislature to shine a little bit and to be part of this new beginning. And uh, governor-elect Angus King, we are told, is entering the building. There he is. Uh, a pleased smile on his face, and why not? He worked hard for this. And uh, he deserves a chance to enjoy all of this applause from more than 6,000 friends, supporters, and as large uh, as members of his family on stage with him tonight. Up until 20 years ago, these inauguration ceremonies took place in the State House legislative chambers during the day. It was, uh, fittingly enough, Maine's first independent governor, Jim Longley, who decided it should be in the evening and here at the Augusta Civic Center where a lot more people can take part and uh, to become more of a public ceremony as it has become. I believe that was exactly 20 years ago, wasn't it, Pat? That's right. It was in 1975 that Maine's first independent governor took the oath of office here. Uh, a lot has changed since then, but uh, here we are with uh, the state of Maine. We'll soon have the only independent governor in the nation. He will be Maine's 71st governor after he takes a couple of oaths of office. In just a few minutes, we will be hearing from a bagpipe band, and then we'll have an invocation, and after we that, Governor-elect Angus King will be sworn in. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with all of those events. Band. They are part of the inaugural ceremony here at the Civic Center for Governor-elect Angus King. And uh, with a name like Angus King, it should be no surprise that he has a bit of Scots blood in him. <laughs> and uh, it's indeed a very stirring way to begin the festivities tonight. As you can see, all of the lights have been dimmed. They're using only spotlights here at the Civic Center to uh, shine on exactly what's happening, adding a little bit of drama to what, what has been promised to be a very dramatic uh, inauguration. We're going to have the uh, invocation shortly. And following that, the president of the Maine Senate, Jeff Butlin, a uh, newly elected president of the Maine Senate, will uh, 
be in charge of the uh, ceremonies, uh, presiding over the joint session of the legislature. Several former governors are here tonight, uh, Burton Cross, John Reed, and Ken Curtis, whom you saw in our 6 o'clock program. Uh, all of the living ex-governors were invited, but uh, Governor Muskie, uh, former Governor Muskie, former Governor Joe Brennan, and outgoing Governor John McKernan couldn't be here tonight. News Center's Bob Elliott is one of our roving reporters out on the floor along with Rob Caldwell. Let's go down to Bob right now. Bob? Well, Rob had mentioned a little earlier that he thought he was in the middle of a wedding. I, it's now a, uh, a Scottish wedding, obviously commemorating Angus King's roots. Uh, the color guard is about ready to go in, and we're going to take this opportunity to go to some interviews that we did earlier in the day with the King family. Angus III, you worked on the campaign in an old Arby's. Now you're in the Blaine house. Are you excited? Uh, the food's a lot better here. I'm uh, terribly excited. Obviously, you know, you never know how it's going to turn out. And after 14 months of work, uh, you couldn't be in a, in a better spot. Uh, it's a great day. Duncan, you were in school in Canada, I believe. Mm -hmm. How are your fellow uh, schoolmates reacting to the fact that your father is now governor of the state to the south? Uh, they think it's pretty neat. They think it's pretty neat. I've invited uh, five or six of them down for the ball on Saturday night and uh, rented a tux for one of them today, and they're all pretty excited. They're pretty excited. James, the youngest, let me ask you, are you nervous at all to be up on the podium tonight? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, as long as I have some coloring books, it should be fine. Uh, <laughs> are you nervous for your father? Uh, no, I mean, I think he's done fine. He's prepared for a speech, so I think it'll be, I think it'll be okay. It should be fun. Okay, that was the, uh, the King family, members of the King family. The color guard is passing us right now, followed by the national anthem. Sharon and Pat, back to you. We're going to take a listen in now as the, uh, the colors are presented and the invocation will be given, and then the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, will be sung by the uh, popular main group, Devon Square. So let's listen in as uh, the ceremony gets underway. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting That our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the independent as your next governor. Of course, this becomes a bipartisan sort of affair, but it's also a multinational gathering. That's right. The governor-elect has 
invited many foreign dignitaries to attend tonight's ceremony. He says he wants to usher in a new era of trade between Maine and these foreign countries. As you know, one of the big issues during the campaign for all of the candidates was jobs, and in this day and age, it's very difficult to create new jobs unless you're expanding your horizons and reaching out. And, and tonight's uh, ceremony with all the foreign dignitaries here is supposed to be symbolic of, as King put it, a new era. And one of the things he'll be talking about in his speech tonight and the video that accompanies it is uh, the best way to make use of the natural resources and the uh, talents of Maine people to attract jobs and improve the economy. Uh, he'll be doing his best to uh, make this an inspirational sort of talk and uh, and I think uh, that's something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Quite a different tone here than at the last inauguration of Governor McKernan's second term. Uh, the economy was in rough shape. We were on the verge of a war in the Persian Gulf. There were protesters outside protesting government budget cuts that were to come. Uh, a much more upbeat kind of feeling to this inauguration. Uh, people are looking for change. We really have a new <laughs> era in the legislature, a lot of change. Everyone says they want a fresh start. And uh, with the, the balance of power in the State House and with an independent in the, in the Blaine House, you are going to have a fresh start and we'll see where that leads us. We're going to be back with more of our coverage of Inauguration 95 right after this. I, Angus Stanley King Jr., do swear, do swear that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution of the United States and of this state, of the United States and of this state, so long as I shall continue so long as I shall continue a citizen thereof, a citizen thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I, Angus Stanley King, Jr. I, Angus Stanley King, Jr. Do swear. Do swear. That I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge. To the best of my abilities. To the best of my abilities. The duties incumbent on me the duties incumbent on me as governor of the state of Maine as governor of the state of Maine according to the Constitution according to the Constitution and laws of the state and laws of the state so help me God so help me God Congratulations. just seen is Governor Angus King take the oath of office, actually two oaths of office, one to uh, swear to support the Constitution of the United States and this state, and a separate second oath to faithfully discharge the duties of governor, both of those required by the main Constitution, with uh, Angus King's mother, Mrs. Ellen King of Williamsburg, Virginia, holding the Bible for him. And the next step is for Maine Secretary of State to uh, conclude a formality of announcing uh, that the legislature recognizes the results of the election and that Angus King is governor and should be obeyed. No surprise was expected in that portion of the ceremony, but Governor King has promised some other surprises back. He has. He's, uh, he's going to be uh, taking a page from Ronald Reagan's book, both in showing a, a video, a film, that he hopes will be inspirational in showing some of the strengths of the state of Maine. He's also going to be singling, singling out some of the people here in the audience tonight. Uh, some state workers, uh, members of the legislature, in an effort to uh, show uh, a sign of unity. The Secretary of State, the Honorable G. William Diamond, will read the proclamation. Votes given on the eighth day of November last in the cities and towns and plantations of the state of Maine for governor, the returns of which have been made to the office of Secretary of State, having been examined and counted by the legislature, which has declared that a priority thereof was given to Angus King, that he is duly elected, and that he has taken and subscribed the oath required by the Constitution to requalify him to discharge the duties of that office. I therefore declare and make known to all persons who are in the exercise of any public trust in this state, as well as all good citizens thereof, that Angus King is Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the State of Maine, and that due obedience should be rendered to all his acts and commands as such. God save the State of Maine!
It is my distinct honor and privilege to present the Honorable Governor of the great state of Maine, Angus Stanley King, Jr. Chief Justice Wathen and members of the, of the judiciary, President Butlin, Speaker Gwadowski and members of the legislature, members of the International Consular Service Corps, family, friends, and citizens of Maine. We have been through hard times together. Maine's economy has been rocked by cutbacks in defense, by a crisis in the fisheries, by a drop in Canadian tourism, by a potato blight, and by a deep New England recession. Many of us have watched helplessly and with great sadness as our children have moved away from Maine in search of opportunity outside our borders. Even worse, in the last few years, there were times when it seemed that our very spirit had been broken. We lost our self-confidence, our resilience, our inner compass. We began to point fingers and assign blame. Mutual trust and public civility collapsed. But somehow, we managed to survive. We have made it through. Now the recession is finally ending, the wounds have begun to heal, and it's time to move on. But we go forward as different people than we were five years ago. We've learned some hard lessons. We are tougher, wiser, and more humble. We now understand, first of all, that we're all in this together and we need each other. We're all in this together, and we need each other. We need each other to do well. We, we need each other to do well, for when one of us succeeds, all are successful. When one of us fails, we all suffer the consequences. It's an old lesson. But sometimes it has to be learned again the hard way, and I deeply hope we've learned it now. We've also relearned another old truth, that we can only make progress tomorrow if we are honest and direct in facing our problems today. In the last few years, we've tried to avoid problems by gimmicks, by games, and by delays. But these schemes haven't worked as a result the problems are still with us. So Maine must now play catch up. We have to do it quickly. And we have to do it honestly with a dose of some old fashioned Maine standbys, common sense, integrity, and a willingness to bite the bullet. Maine people tell me they're ready. Our legislators tell me they're ready. I am ready. This will be the year. But, but, we cannot do it with a fractured political system that's more political than system. We can't... We can't do it with partisanship and bickering. Did you send us to Augusta for that? We can't do it with name-calling and gamesmanship. 
Did you send us to Augusta for that? We can't do it by avoiding the tough calls and playing games with the budget. Did you send us to Augusta for that? And finally, we can't do it by going to the people for more taxes. I know you didn't send us to Augusta for that. But if we put the politics aside and work together, not seeking universal agreement, but seeking at least an atmosphere of mutual respect and trust, we can do it. We can solve the budget problem, but perhaps more importantly, in the process of doing so, we can restore the people's faith in the system and in us. As a symbol of my determination determination to make this happen. I've invited the leaders of the legislature and two representatives of the state's workforce to join me on the platform here tonight. For no one governs Maine or does the people's business alone. Representative Joe Carlton, stand up now. Representative Libby Mitchell, Representative Paul Jakes, Representative Walt Whitcomb, Speaker Dan Gwadowski, Senator Bev Buston, Senator Jane Amaro, Senator Leo Kiefer, Senator Mark Lawrence, President Jeff Butlin, and Carol Whitney of the DH of uh, Department of Human Services and Clyde Walton from DOT, two dedicated state workers. I salute each of you for your commitment to Maine, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to work with you and the other legislators out here and employees of the state you represent as we undertake the historic task of preparing Maine and her people for a new century. But before we begin that journey, we have some unfinished business that I've mentioned, the now chronic shortfall in our state's budget. Jobs is the first priority. But we will never fully recover until we get the state's fiscal house in order. I am absolutely convinced that there is only one way to solve this problem. No more gimmicks, no more delays, no more taxes. We look the problem in the eye, and nobody on this side blinks. And so we must continue the painful task of reining in state spending while at the same time empowering our employees with the tools, the technology, and the management to do their jobs with enthusiasm and pride. And we can do it. And we can do it if we stick together, if we don't lose heart, if we stay honest and resolute, and above all, if we keep before us the big picture, that a healthy economy is the engine of all social progress, and that individual programs, no matter how worthy, must sometimes give way to the overriding need to show the people of Maine that their government is finally ready to live within its means. And this process starts at this time and in this place. Right now, I am signing an executive order which freezes state hiring without the specific approval of the governor's office. From this day forward, the state government of Maine will be smaller. And, and
And it is my intention to recommend that the savings from this action be used to eliminate the so-called payroll push where the state employees don't get paid in June until July so we can demonstrate to them that we care about their lives and livelihoods and demonstrate to the world that Maine is kicking the budget habit once and for all. And now, see, I've still got the pen out. And now I am signing a second executive order requiring a system-wide review of all state regulations. And, and I will maintain and strengthen the current executive order, which requires prior review by the governor's office of all new regulations. From this day forward, the state government of Maine is on your side. They're getting nervous. I've still got it here. And finally, I'm signing a third executive order to subject state contracts and grants with outside sources to a rigorous and thorough review. From this day forward, the state government of Maine will understand that it is the people's hard-earned money that is being spent. I am, I am committed to these and other steps that will return the state government of Maine to her people and establish once and for all that the government is here to serve the people and not the other way around. But is this all there is? Talk of budget deficits and tough choices, a hiring freeze and biting the bullet? No, no, because I've got a secret to share. Can we talk? <laughs> right now, right now, it's a rustling. It's an impression, a feeling, but it's real. Maine is on the move. In Arusta County, there's a new mall and an accounting center coming. Maine is on the move. In the Western Mountains, the nationally acclaimed Bethel Station Project is opening a new gateway to Sunday River. And up the road, the longest, fastest quad lift in the east rolls to the top of Sugarloaf. Maine is on the move. In the south, in the south, Old Orchard has spruced up its downtown. The Sea Dogs and the Pirates are the rage and the arts are thriving. Maine is on the move. Along the coast, along the coast, our quality of life and state-of-the-art telecommunications have brought us MBNA, CFAX, and Auto Europe, and hundreds of new jobs. Maine is on the move. Down east, down east, blueberries are becoming a world-class crop and the port at Eastport is coming back. Maine is on the move. A new spirit of partnership is spreading across the land. We recognize that our common humanity and our common citizenship bind us together more closely than any labels which divide us. Maine is on the move. Before we are rich or poor, before we are north or south, before we are Republicans, Democrats, or independents, <laughs> we are, first of all, members of the human family. We are fathers and mothers, neighbors and friends. We are, simply put, the people of Maine. And we must understand that the future is ours. It will be what we make it. We have it within our power here tonight.
to make Maine one of the world's special places, a place where our children have real opportunity, where we live in harmony with the natural environment and where we can be proud of our heritage. What it will take is commitment, good faith, teamwork, and vision. And so tonight, I want to share my vision with you a vision for Maine in the new century. But since visions are more than words, I've asked Maine filmmaker Jeff Dobbs to help me present mine to you. And in the process, to present Maine itself in all its variety, beauty, and essential strength. Geography has always shaped its destiny. European America really began off our coast as fishermen and loggers came from England and France to tap the rich resources of the cold North Atlantic and the nearby forests. For generations, the harvest of the sea sustained our people and kept their faces turned toward the world. Maine made coasters and clipper ships were the fiber optics of their age, linking Maine to the world of trade and jobs. The charm of our coastal towns, Bath, Camden, Thomaston, Bangor, yes, Bangor, dates from the days when real wealth sprang from the sea. When my ship comes in had a literal meaning in those times, and we are still the richer for it. Inland, too, geography determined our economy and defined our character. If ever you feel overwhelmed by the 20th century, taxes, the telephone, traffic. Stop for a moment and contemplate clearing the land of a rustic without the benefit of tractor or backhoe. And we became a state of small towns, towns whose names often remind us of those who were here first, Millinocket, Skowhegan, Agunquit, Damrascata, or towns across the ocean the settlers called home, Falmouth, Bath, Rumford, Belgrade, Bristol, or heroes of the founding days, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, and a town in the Western Mountains named for our first governor, my own personal favorite, Kingfield. And then, of course, come our country towns, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Peru, Mexico, China. A few thousand souls perched at the corner of a vast continent with no one to turn to for aid or support but themselves. Life in these small towns defined our character. Honesty and fair dealing are not optional qualities in such a place. When repeat business is all there is, these qualities are necessary to survive. A flinty self-sufficiency, which translated into a sometimes cranky independence, also arose from small town circumstances, especially when coupled with hard land and an even harder climate. But interdependence was necessary as well. In Winthrop in 1850, there was no one to turn to for help in time of crisis, except your neighbors. Farmers, fishermen, loggers, all more or less solitary pursuits, which formed the basis of our economy and our character. As the slope of the White Mountains crosses Maine to the Atlantic Rim, water falls in the Kennebec, the Penobscot, the Androscoggin, and the Saco. And to the founders of Maine, falling water meant one thing, power. And the Industrial Revolution came to America. Wherever there were falls, there soon were water wheels and mills. And Brunswick, Lewiston, Rumford, Waterville, Biddeford, Augusta sprang to industrial life. To these mills came new settlers, the Franco-Americans from Quebec, to enrich our social, economic, and cultural life. Bienvenue, mes amis, et merci bien pour tous que vous avez donné à la terre de Maine. And then, of course, come the forests, sweeping like a mighty wave from the Canadian border across Maine to the very margin of the sea. 
From the air, the trees melt together to form a light green ocean with islands that mark our northern towns and mill stacks which mimic the masts of coastal schooners. In the early days, the real masts came from Maine, and the forests have provided for us ever since. Lumber, clothespins, dowels, chairs, log homes, and paper. Tons of paper, miles of paper, mountains of paper. And from paper, some of the best jobs in Maine. For sheer, overwhelming industrial power, the sight of a six-story high paper machine producing a 30-foot wide sheet at the rate of a mile a minute, making the very ground shake, is hard to capture any way but in person. Those machines, like the wood turners of Solon, the sardine canners of Belfast, or the blueberry packers of Machias, are machines for adding value, for creating wealth, for their owners to be sure, but for the people of Maine as well. The first settlers, by the way, returned to Europe for the winter with their ship's holds full of salted cod and haddock. Do you suppose the Native Americans had a word that translated today would mean summer people? And of course, visitors are still one of our most important natural resource-based industries, our incomparable coast. The rolling fields of the county and fishing, lakes beyond counting. And the greatest monument to the foresight, determination, and generosity of one person that exists in America, Baxter Park, and a magical place called Catan. Assembled painstakingly over 60 years and thrust into the hands of a sometimes reluctant state government, this gem of Maine stands as a testament to generations as yet unborn that we sometimes can, even as individuals, make a real difference in the world. But what of the future? Where does our vision and our geography lead us? The answer lies in the journey we have already taken with some new opportunities, technology has opened to us. We must create sustainable fisheries, for example. The traditional wealth of the deep sea, cod, haddock, and flounder, teeters on the brink of commercial extinction, and families which have invested generations of effort face possible disaster. To help them, and to preserve our fisheries for the long term, we must understand nature better and at the same time, make sure that Washington understands us. But as we do this, we must also move aggressively to take advantage of the new opportunity created by aquaculture. We must become farmers of the sea, for we have at our edge a field as vast and fertile as the Great Plains of the Middle West. An aquaculture industry comparable to Norway's would employ 9,000 and help to feed the world. The forest remains a mighty resource, vast, productive, renewable. We need new markets for our wood products, and we must take special care that the costs we impose through government, workers' comp, taxes, regulations, don't stifle our ability to make sure that value is added to wood in Maine and not outside our borders. And we certainly can do tourism better. Just across our borders to the south and to the north and across the ocean at our side are millions of mobile, affluent, time-pressed individuals who would love Maine if we could get them here first. But we must think strategically about tourism, spreading out the season and the locations where we welcome visitors. In the process of rebuilding Maine, we must never compromise the integrity of our environment. It's not only immoral, it's bad economics. But at the same time, we can safeguard the environment without an army of regulators and a bushel full of fine print. Maine people love the environment, 
every bit as much as any official in Augusta. It's time to reduce our reliance on litigation and try a little more cooperation. Our final natural resource is our quality of life. We have what the world wants, creative and hardworking people, an unspoiled natural environment, and a civil society that works. This means that we can and will be home to the next worldwide wave of economic development, a wave that doesn't need falling water or forest resources, roads or smokestacks. All that's needed are fine strands of spun glass and ever smaller chips to direct the flow of invisible bits of information. Telecommunications can move us from the edge of the national economy to the center of the global economy and can finally neutralize the disadvantage geography dealt us so long ago. Finally, our greatest resource is our people. We are boat builders, secretaries and teachers, paper workers, nurses and managers, loggers and computer programmers, social workers, fishermen and engineers. We share a common heritage. We share a common stewardship of the land. We share a common pride in an extraordinary place called Maine. If Maine people are given the tools, education, infrastructure, opportunity, we will reach out to make the future our own. And the best of Maine, land of deep woods, jagged coasts, and people of integrity, will endure and flourish. I think Jeff Dobbs is a natural resource. You have bestowed upon me a sacred trust and a solemn challenge. I accept this trust and will not dishonor it. I welcome this challenge and will not shrink from it. The future does indeed belong to all of us. And with God's help, we who are assembled here tonight, as well as those in their homes all across every corner of Maine on this cold New England evening, will reach out together to secure the future for ourselves and those who follow. Thank you. An inaugural address like none we have seen or heard from Governor Angus King putting his television background to good use as he not only told us what his vision for the state of Maine is, but he showed us in some absolutely beautiful film and videotape talking about the uh, natural resources and the human resources. We'll be back to wrap up our coverage of New Center's inauguration 95 right after this.